What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I have an interesting video I didn't plan on making, and this is actually kind of on me for not catching up to Critical Role to Current, but Matt Mercer released two subclasses today, uh, and we're going to discuss one of them in this video, and that is the Oath of the Open Sea Paladin. If you've been following Campaign 2, I'm pretty sure you can guess who this is going to be for. Um, but I actually did not catch the episode on the, uh, whatever it was, the 15th. I missed that, so I'm just going to look at things purely from a mechanical standpoint, not from, like, the lore standpoint in the game. But that doesn't really necessarily matter if we're just discussing the subclass as it stands. So before we jump into that, I just wanted to say, if you haven't taken a moment to subscribe to the channel uh, and you like what I do here, I would really appreciate it if you did so. The channel has had exponential growth in the past year, and I really can't thank all of you enough for helping to subscribe to the channel and grow Nerd Immersion. Uh, it's allowed me to pursue avenues and venues that I never thought I'd be able to, and that's really all because of you. So if you watch these videos, you see what I do here, and you like it, please consider subscribing. There's going to be a ton more coverage of news and Tasha's Cauldron of everything when that comes out in a little over a month. Uh, so hopefully you look forward to that. That being said, let's jump over to D&D Beyond and we'll take a look. So we can see it's right here. It also does have this big red marker because folks, this is true. It is not official content. That means it is not something like the Echo Knight Fighter or, you know, the Dunamancy Wizard or any of that kind of stuff. Um, this is not official published material. This is something that Matt made as a homebrew. And just I purely because of the popularity of Critical Role, it gets to be posted on D&D Beyond. It's kind of just like the Blood Hunter, the Gunslinger Fighter, and so on. Also, part of the reason is Matt probably already made these subclasses in the game for the characters to go ahead and choose and use when they're playing it. And because D&D Beyond and Critical Role have such a tight relationship, they went ahead and did this because a lot of people will be curious about it anyway. So again, not official material. It says it right here. Aren't officially part of D&D and aren't permitted in Adventures League. To use this content, toggle critical role content on and off in your individual character sheet. So it's going to talk a little bit about the backstory here, what the tenants are. Wild Mother, Storm Lord, that makes sense. Let's dive into the mechanics. Oath spells, all right? Create or destroy water. Uh, again, remember, you're playing a paladin here, so you're not going to get spells till you hit uh, second level. You're not going to get access to any of the stuff to hit third level when you choose your oath. And remember that you can always spend your paladin spell slots for smiting. And depending on the situation, probably more often than not, if you're in a combat scenario, smiting, I'd say most times, ends up being a better use of your spell slots. But Creator Destroy Water does give you some good out of combat utility. Um, as someone who's playing a campaign where we were traveling through the desert, Creator Destroy Water would have been huge. Um, Expeditious Retreat, uh, it's a concentrate. It lets you dash as a bonus action, but it's a concentration spell. There's potentially better options for you to have that up. Augury is an interesting one because Augury is like a it's a future sight kind of one here, right? Um, and then Misty Step is a fantastic spell for a paladin. Uh, highly recommend it if you can get it. So great choice there. Call Lightning again. We're also we're dealing with the thematics of the open sea and waves and, and sailors and, and storms and things. Um, call lightning. I don't love call lightning because it's an action to call down the lightning bolt. If it was an action to cast it the first time and a bonus action every subsequent turn, that would be huge. Um, but because you're a paladin, by the time you get access to this spell, you'll have two attacks already. You might even be better off just attacking and smiting twice than call using call lightning, but that's just the spell. Uh, tidal wave, again, um, it's a nice AoE. Paladins, that's the biggest thing Paladins lack, which is also kind of a point in favor of Call Lightning. Paladins lack area of effect spells. You're pretty much, a, you're great at, at buffs, you're great at protecting the party, and you're great at single target damage takedowns with smites. You don't have a lot of AoE ability. Uh, and Tidal Wave does give you a little bit of that, also with the potential for a prone. Uh, and then the, the just, again, the concept of using water, which may help you put out fires and things. Again, thematically, control water kind of just makes sense. Um, and then freedom of movement is another very good spell. It's nice because freedom of movement is non-concentration, uh, non uh, and you have it for free, so that's good. And then you have commune with nature. Um, not, I don't think typically a spell a paladin will have access to. They might have regular old commune. And then maelstrom, another good AoE attack that makes a lot of sense for paladins to have, especially if they're going to be oceanary, you know, sea-based. 
All right, let's talk about our channel divinities. We get marine layer at third. We get two options. You get to use one. You get your channel divinity back on a short rest. Um, marine layer as an action you can channel the sea to create a thick fog a uh, cloud of fog that surrounds you and heavily obscures the area for 20 feet in all directions following you as you move which is nice because it's a traveling cloud of fog you and all creatures within five feet of you instead treat this fog as lightly obscured the fog lasts for 10 minutes spreads around corners and cannot be dispersed so a reminder if something is heavily dis uh, obscured you basically can't see it at all and you're basically considered to be blinded if something is lightly obscured, you just have disadvantage on perception checks. But if you and your friends are basically traveling through this fog cloud, um, you can see out, albeit a disadvantage on perception checks, but people can't see in. Or you could use Fury of the Tides as a bonus action. Channel the powerful might of the waves to bolster your attacks for one minute. Once per turn for the duration, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can choose to push the target 10 feet away from you. If it's pushed into an obstacle or another creature, they take additional bludgeoning damage equal to your charisma modifier. Um, that's not bad. I, you know, the first one is really good for sneaking and stealth, which is typically not a thing a paladin is very good at. Uh, and then Fury of the Tides is interesting because uh, it, it lasts a bonus action to activate and it lasts for a minute. Um, and it's, there is no, and I, I don't think, uh, this is technically on the overpowered side. So it only happens once on a turn. So even if you hit somebody with two attacks, you can only choose to do it once. You can push them 10 feet away. The only downside, uh, or on the balance side of that is it doesn't limit the size. So you, a small paladin could in theory, push a gargantuan creature away from you 10 feet, no saving throw. You just do it. Uh, and then if you push them into an obstacle or a creature, they take additional bludgeoning damage equal to your charisma modifier. I'm okay with the extra damage. I like that charisma modifier. Uh, it's usually going to be good as a paladin. It's not a ton of damage. Uh, the only potential downside I see is there is no limit to the size of the creature that you're pushing. Uh, maybe huge or smaller might be okay, but either way. Then we get Aura of Liberation. Auras are my favorite part about paladins. I love passive abilities. Uh, things that you can just rely on, and this is a great one. Um, you and your allies of your choice, allies of your choice within ten feet of you, cannot be grappled or restrained, which is that. See, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that can be game changing, especially if you're on a boat, right? You might be dealing with krakens and things like that. Things with arms and tentacles, not being restrained, is fantastic. As well as you ignore movement uh, penalties on movements or attacks while underwater. Again, that's such a simple snippet, that little bit there, but that is huge and very thematic to the class. So I do enjoy that. Uh, creatures that are already grappled or restrained, uh, when they enter the aura, can spend five feet of movement to automatically escape non magical restraints. And then at 18th, the aura goes out to 30 feet. I also like that because we find that a lot in certain abilities where it's just like, okay, it does these good things for you if it, you know, if it hasn't happened already, like you're immune to it, you can't be affected by it if it's, if it hasn't happened yet. But a lot of times we find certain abilities in fifth edition that they don't do anything if it's already happening. And I like that this doesn't give you just, it doesn't end it completely. It still requires you to use movement to break out of it, which is not typically something you do for grapple, but it's five feet of your movement and it's a freebie. And that kind of makes sense to me. So I'm, I like that. Um, and we haven't seen a paladin aura like this. I like the auras. Like there are certain auras out there for paladins that I don't particularly enjoy where it's like, it's an aura, but it's not really. It's like, it's an aura, but you have to use your reaction to do the thing, and it only happens so many times per long rest. To me, a true aura is something that is out. It is up constantly, and it just works, and I, this is what this is, so I like it. Uh, stormy waters at level 15. You can call crashing waters around you as a reaction whenever a creature enters or exits your melee range. The creature takes a D12 bludgeoning damage and must succeed a strength saving throw or be knocked prone. So that's an interesting one. Paladins don't have reaction utility typically. So anything as a paladin that you can do as a bonus action or a reaction is usually really powerful because they don't typically have access to things like that. They're a very action heavy class. Now what's interesting is the way this is worded. Um, as a reaction, whenever a creature enters or exits your melee range, they take a d12 bludgeoning damage and must succeed on a strength saving throw or be knocked prone. So that's good. If someone closes the distance to you, they might take damage and then uh, need to make a strength saving throw or be knocked prone. And then they might need to, they might not have enough movement left to stand up, which is, could be a big one. If they're like, they moved 30 feet to hit you, 
and then they they get into your melee range, they take the damage, they're knocked prone. They don't have any more movement left to stand back up, so they have to make their attacks at disadvantage while being prone. Or if they exit your melee range, they take the damage and then they can be knocked prone. Um, but what's interesting is, in theory, Stormy Waters works with Fury of the Tides. I don't know if that's intentional, but follow through with me here. So once per turn for the duration, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, so it's your turn, you hit a creature with your your weapon, you push that target 10 feet away from you, okay? It's pushed 10 feet. It has now exited your melee range, okay? Uh, therefore, as a reaction, now that it has exited your melee range they uh, take a d12 bludgeoning damage and must succeed on a strength saving throw or be knocked prone. So you hit it once, it knocks it back 10 feet, exiting, assuming your reach is only 5 feet with like a sword, let's say. You hit them, they're knocked back 10 feet, they have left your melee range, therefore triggering a, uh, Stormy Waters dealing a d12 bludgeoning damage. They need to make a strength saving throw or be knocked prone. You might have also knocked them into someone or someone else dealing charisma modifier damage to them. And you then could, in theory, close the distance to them. If they're knocked prone, then you could make your second attack against them with advantage if they're prone because you have two attacks. So that is some really crazy synergy. And I do think it's interesting that Stormy Waters works um, all the time. It's an always on ability. As long as you have your reaction, you can use it. There's no, like, you can only use this thing, you know, so many times per long rest. And I, you know, I'm a, I'm biased towards Paladins, I'll be honest with you. So I like this a lot, um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. And lastly, we get the kind of Paladin level 20 ability, which is the big Paladin awesome. This is why I think Paladins are one of the best classes in the game. Uh, aside from everything else, their, their capstone ability, their level 20 ability is usually very strong. And I like that. Uh, it's usually a transformation or something of some kind that kind of gives you severe boosts for about a minute, sometimes an hour. Uh, as an action, you embrace the spirits of the sea, gaining the following benefits for a minute. Climbing costs no additional movement. You have advantage on strength athletics checks. Again, this works well if you're on a boat, climbing rigging, things like that. If you are within five feet of a creature and no other creatures are within five feet of you, you have advantage on your attacks against that creature. This is basically like, I think it's rackish audacity. Uh, the swashbuckler has um, that would give them sneak attack but you have advantage if you are alone and it's called mythic swashbuckler so that makes sense right the thought process behind a swashbuckler is i'm a duelist i'm a person i take you on one on one therefore if i am a mythic swashbuckler it makes sense that i have advantage if i'm facing you and you alone kick the dodge action as a bonus action which is an interesting one to choose but again if you're a mythic swashbuckler there's no reason why you couldn't be like, I dodge as a bonus action and then I attack them twice. They have disadvantage. I'm doing my swashbuckler thing. Uh, and then lastly, you have advantage on all dexterity ability checks and dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see. Again, tapping into this. And one thing I do think is interesting, uh, and this is once per long rest, it doesn't explicitly state it because that's not technically a thing you need to worry about with paladins. This one seems to me, in my opinion, to be the most dex paladin, paladin subclass that exists. Technically, there's nothing stopping a paladin from being a, uh, a strength or a dex paladin. And given the situation uh, of someone that may be multi-classed, let's say, into Hexblade, uh, where you use your charisma for all your attack and damage rolls, you may not have a ton of strength. So it's interesting that this side of it, all the end abilities here are based on dexterity. And I think that that's pretty interesting. So overall, the class, it's a little funky. Um, it's obviously very specific because it kind of makes sense with the character. But I like it. There isn't, uh, I, I, you know, I feel like the other ones are very, like, idealistic. And this is the open sea. Kind of feels a little out of left field. Um, but that's okay. I don't, I don't dislike it. I, the spells I would have potentially put, I don't know what other spells I would have put on here. But I do like that you do have some awesome role play useful spells in there, which is nice. Um, this is the only paladin I think that really has a good sneaking ability in this marine layer, this traveling fog. Um, and then again, we already talked about the potential synergy with Fury of the Tides and Stormy Waters, which I like. Uh, like I said, any chance you can get to use your bonus action or your reaction consistently as a paladin is a big deal. Um, 
And then again, Aura of Liberation is just something we haven't seen before. So let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, it's interesting to see. I think this has come a long way. A lot of people in the past have often said that they're not a big fan of Matt Mercer's work, whether it be his subclasses or his classes, because they feel like they are often uh, very overpowered. Um, in a lot of cases, people usually cite the gunslinger fighter as an example of something that's very overpowered. Um, and I think this is actually really good. I think a lot of the abilities are uh, someone who's kind of very steeped in doing a lot of balance right now uh, for classes and things. I think this is very clean is a word I'll use. It. The abilities are simple. They're easy to understand. And that's important with 5th edition because even though there's a bunch of people playing, there's also a lot of new players. So simplicity is key with 5th edition. As long as the abil abilities that are very overly complicated, doing a whole bunch of different stuff are hard to fit into the grand scope of 5e. So the simpler and cleaner you can make things, the better. And this, honestly, this class does not have anything that's over the top, overly complicated. Things fit in here pretty well. Uh, and I could potentially see this end up being something that gets published in a future book. Um, and, you know, Matt has the contacts at Wizards of the Coast to possibly make that an option. But let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Do you like the Oath of the Open Sea? Uh, it's not a Paladin subclass I ever thought I needed and or wanted, and I'm still not sure that that's the case, but I'm always a, a sucker for more options. And this could have some really interesting potential to, to multi-class this with a Storm Sorcerer, if you really want to tap into that sea stormy vibe, and I like that concept a lot, actually. Um, so again, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Stay tuned for the next video in this series where we're going to go visit because they put out the Oath of the Cobalt, or not the Oath, the Way of the Cobalt Soul Monk, which has seen a variety of iterations from its original publishing in the Tal'Dorei campaign guide to some D&D Beyond. I, or sorry, I thought there was a DM's Guild post. There were several Twitter-based updates, and now we have a final version that I guess that Bo is using currently in Critical Role, so we can go ahead and take a look at that and see how it stacks up, see what our thoughts are, how it handles with the rest of the other Monk subclasses out there. Thank you again to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. Take a look in the description. You still have less than 24 hours left to enter my Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frost Maiden giveaway, as well as a chance to back a Kickstarter that I'm involved in from a balance perspective and possibly even a design perspective as well. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.